Hello and welcome to my account. My name's Joel and this is a new series that I'm diving into about people who have zero morals. Today we're traveling to Minnesota to visit Minneapolis and St. Paul. During the 1980s, there was a lunatic out running the streets looking for his next victim. And almost every time he would do something heinous, he would call the police and start whining. This is the disturbing case of Paul Michael Stefani. Most of the time when someone is capable of doing something awful, they usually end up not being remorseful. But Paul Michael Stefani is an odd one. Being one of 10 children, he was born on September 8th of 1944 to a very religious family. He grew up in Austin, Minnesota, which is home to about 25,000 people. And in 2015, it was named one of the top 10 affordable small towns where you'd actually want to live and one of the best small cities in America. I guess it can't be too bad. His mother had divorced Stefani's father when he was three and she got married to another man. And so Stefani grew up on a five acre plot with his mother, his stepfather, and nine other siblings. According to many accounts, his stepfather was very abused. Paul said that if any of the children got in his stepfather's way, he would smack them in the head and push them down the stairs. In the early 1960s, after finishing high school, Paul moved 100 miles north to St. Paul. Here he would work a few different jobs and soon find himself at the Malmberg Manufacturing Company in the 1970s. During this time, he met a woman named Beverly and they fell in love and got married. A short while after, they ended up having a daughter together and Paul's life seemed to be going great. But all good things must come to an end and sometime during these years, his marriage started to fail and him and Beverly had gotten a divorce. Paul would no longer be in his ex-wives or his daughter's lives. And then to top it all off, in 1977, he was fired from his job at the Malmberg Manufacturing Company. One thing after another, after another, after another. Shortly after the divorce, he would be arrested for assault, but very little details of this case exist. From 1977 to 1980, he was really trying to get his life together and ended up getting a new job and dating a woman from Syria. But once again, things would take a turn for the worse when his girlfriend had returned to Syria to accept an arranged marriage. This left Paul feeling horrible and ferocious. His anger took over him and he decided that it was all because of women and he wanted to make them suffer. And so on New Year's Eve of 1980, he found himself completely alone with nowhere to go and no family to celebrate with. But Paul had another agenda on his mind and he was on the hunt. Driving around St. Paul at one in the morning looking for his first victim, he saw 20-year-old Karen Potak walking by herself. She was wearing the color red. She was a university student from Wisconsin and was in St. Paul celebrating New Year's with her sisters. They were all out in a club partying when Karen got mad go figure. And she left the club without telling anyone. Paul pulled up next to her and offered her a place to go that was warm and she just accepted it and got inside of the car. He started driving and went to a place that he knew all too well, the Malmberg Manufacturing Company. Paul pulled up behind the engine room and the scenario was dark and quiet. Karen had been questioning him the entire time about what was going on, but he completely ignored her. He turned off his car went to the back of his trunk and he pulled out a tire iron. He demanded that Karen get out of the car, but she refused and so he attacked her. He hit her over the head with a tire iron, knocked her unconscious, dragged her out of the car, threw her on the ground and proceeded to do the exact same thing. Paul thought she was dead, so he got back in his car and he sped off. What he just did started to hit him and he became overwhelmed with feelings of shame and guilt. He felt like he needed to help Karen and confess his actions to someone. And so he found a phone booth and he called the police. Yes, please, this is an emergency. Please send a squad to piss on the road. Uh, Malmberg Manufacturing Company Machine Shop. Please, there's an ambulance too. There's a girl hurt there. Can you tell me what happened to her? Just hurry. There's a, she's laying on the ground in the back by the by the railroad tracks by the edge here. What, what's the address? I don't know. Who are you? Police got there as fast as they could and they found Karen badly wounded, but she was still alive. Very little evidence was at the crime scene and Karen had suffered brain trauma, so she remembered absolutely nothing of that night. Paul was incredibly anxious about this and watched the news like a hawk, expecting the police to knock on the door and arrest him at any minute. But they never came and soon Paul had realized that he had just gotten away with an awful crime. He laid low for about six more months until June 3rd of 1981. Paul was eating at a 
diner when something suddenly struck him when he saw 18-year-old Kimberly Compton. She was dressed in red and she had just graduated high school and was new to St. Paul. Paul started talking to her and offered to drive her down to a river to have a picnic and she accepted. He took her to a place with a good view of the river and he parked his car. Paul told Kimberly to get out and just go look around, that it would be something to tell her parents about. She walked down to the river and Paul walked to the trunk of his car. There he pulled out an ice pick and he followed behind her, concealing it so she wouldn't see it. They lied down in the grass together and listened to the flow of the river, and without saying a single word, Paul randomly attacked her. He ended up stabbing her 61 times and strangled her with her own shoelace. When Paul knew Kimberly was gone, he stood up and he looked at what he just did and he realized that he had to cover his tracks. He tried to clean up as best as he could and then he just went back to his car. Yet again while driving, reality started to kick in, but he knew that she was dead and that he couldn't help her, so he just didn't call the police. He ended up driving back home and tried to figure out what to do next. Kimberly was found by three teenage boys and they called the police and an investigation immediately began. Paul saw what was going on on the television and felt like he needed to call the police again. <laughs> You find me, I just stabbed somebody with an ice pick. I can't stop myself. I keep killing somebody. Hello? Are you there? Investigators picked up immediately that this could have been the same caller as six months prior, so they deemed him the weepy voiced killer. They released the recordings to the public in hopes that someone would recognize his voice and waited for him to call again. Because he had so much guilt built up and he was also watching the news, he actually made the call. Don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry what I did to Compton. I couldn't help it. Don't know why I had to stab her. I am so upset about it. I keep getting drunk every day and I can't believe it. It's like a big dream. I can't think of being locked up. If I get locked up, I'll kill myself. I'd rather kill myself to get locked up. I'll just try not to kill anybody else. Nothing came from these calls and Paul laid low for over a year until his violent urges suddenly struck him again. On July 21st of 1982, he was driving through the suburbs of a town called Lauderdale when it hit him. Paul saw 33-year-old Kathleen Greening packing her car for a weekend trip. Sitting across the street in his car, he watched her and he waited for her to go back into her home. As soon as she did, he got out of his car and he made his way in. Paul walked through the front door and heard the sound of running water and so he knew she was in the bathroom. Room. He quietly crept over to the door and saw her getting a bath ready. Then he attacked her, and before she could scream for help, he held her head under the water and drowned her. In this situation, however, he did not call the police, but he still needed to confess. So Paul went to his local church and sat in the confession booth and cried. What a little bit. But because Paul didn't make a phone call to the police, and the way that Kathleen was murdered was different than the other victims, Police did not think that this was the same person. On August 5th, only two short weeks after Paul had just murdered Kathleen Greening, he met another woman, 40-year-old Barbara Simmons. They were both at the Hexagon Bar in Minneapolis, and she too, just like all the other victims, was wearing red. Paul walked up to Barbara and asked her if he could bum a cigarette. The two started talking, and Barbara immediately thought he was charming, and they hit it off really well. Late into the night, Paul offered her a ride home, and she accepted. Barbara had told the bartender that she was leaving with a man that she had just met, and the bartender had gotten a really, really good look of him. Instead of driving her home, Paul yet again drove to a secluded area near the Mississippi River, and he attacked Barbara. He stabbed her over 100 times until she was finally gone. Paul uncarefully attempted to hide her body near the river and discarded the weapon he just used. The next morning on the 6th, a paper boy discovered Barbara's lifeless body and he immediately called the police. Two days later on the 8th, Paul yet again started to feel an immense amount of guilt and so he called the police. Fire emergency. Please don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry, I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. Kimberly Compton was the first one. Oh my chief, oh, I don't know what's the matter me. I'm sick. I'm gonna kill myself, I think. Where are you? I'm just gonna, I, there's so many guys with a red shirt on. It's me, I killed both of them. Yet again, the weepy voice killer had struck and police had nothing to help find him until they did. Back at the Hexagon Bar where Paul had met Barbara, the bartender had gave police a very good description of the culprit. He said the man was in his 40s, around six feet tall, 
with dark hair and dark eyes. The police looked through their records to find anyone who matched that description, and they came up with eight suspects. They showed the bartender a photo of all the suspects, and he immediately pinpointed Paul Michael Stefani. Finally, the investigators had a great lead, but they couldn't arrest him yet because they still needed more evidence. Luckily for them, Paul was planning for another victim. During the night of August 20th, Paul was driving through East Minneapolis when he approached 19-year-old worker Denise Williams. She, like all the other victims, was also wearing red. I don't know what his obsession with red is, but it really triggered him. Paul offered Denise $100 for her services, and she gladly accepted. She got into his car, and he drove back to his apartment in St. Paul, where they proceeded to have sex. After they were done, Paul offered to drive her home, and so she accepted. Paul started driving down side roads and through neighborhoods and not through the highway, and so this made Denise very anxious. Paul started rambling about his fantasies, and immediately Denise knew something was wrong and she had to get out of that situation. Soon, Paul would pull into a dark parking lot and turn off the car. He demanded that Denise pay him for the ride, and she started panicking and trying to get out of the car, but Paul kept pulling her back in. He grabbed a screwdriver out of his glove box and stabbed her in the stomach with it. Denise leapt into the back seat as Paul kept trying to stab her, and she knew that if she didn't fight back, she was going to die. She reached onto the floor to try to grab anything that she could to fight back, and she found a glass bottle, and then she hit him on the head with it. She then used the bottle to slice his face open and slice his hands open as well. Paul was yelling in pain, and he opened the passenger door, and they both fell out grappling each other. He tried very hard to get control over Denise, but she was fighting for her life. A young man who lived nearby named Douglas Panning heard Denise screaming and he ran over to the scene. He saw what was going on and so he grabbed Paul's arm and tried to stop him from killing her. Paul put his focus on Douglas trying to attack him and he chased him out of the parking lot. Douglas outran him and he went back to his house and he called the police right away. Paul ran back to his car and he sped away thinking that Denise was dead. He drove home and as his adrenaline started to wear down, he realized that he was bleeding very badly and needed medical attention. Fearful he was going to die, Paul called 911 and told the dispatcher that he had just gotten beaten up and needed an ambulance. Need an ambulance? Where? 1505 Westminster. 1505? Yes. Westminster, what's the problem? I'm all cut up. I got beat up. What's your apartment number? 208. I'm bleeding. 208. Where are you bleeding from? From my arm, my face. The dispatchers, however, had been told of his heinous crimes and to be on the lookout for him, and this dispatcher immediately recognized his voice. An ambulance picked Paul up, but little did he know the police were going to be at the hospital waiting for him. While at the hospital, Paul got treated for his injuries, and then the police took him down to the station to be interrogated. Detective Don Brown was the lead on this case and would be the one to interrogate Paul. He pretended to be concerned about the uh, attack that Paul just endured, so he could get him comfortable and gain his trust. It worked, and then the detective started to show him pictures of his victims and ask about the weepy-voiced killer. Paul's voice became high-pitched, and he started to become very anxious, and so Detective Don Brown knew he had his guy. Paul maintained his innocence, and they didn't have enough evidence to charge him with everything, but they still ended up charging him with the murder of Barbara Simmons and attempted murder of Denise Williams. After a long, drawn-out trial in April of 1985, Paul was convicted of all charges that were against him and sentenced to 40 years in prison. Only 40 years? But after 12 years behind bars, in December of 1997, Paul was 53 years old when he was diagnosed with skin cancer. The doctors told him the cancer had spread to his entire body and he had less than a year to live. And so he had one last thing to do before he passed away. Confess to the police everything that he did. Paul talked with a pair of detectives and told them everything that they needed to know. She got in my car and I gave her my driving to license. They heated me out in a minute. I had to clean some of the ice off the windshield. Do you remember where you hit her with the tire and Paul? Yeah. Did you hit her one time, two times? Yeah, it must have been about 30 times, but I mean, a good, good 20 times, I think, about. Were you swinging it this way or did you poke her with it? Did you no, I, didn't, I don't think I poked her, no. I, I remember it just hit her mainly on the forehead, on the cheek, and the jaw, the mouth, and the top of the head. And, I think it was only about 10 times, but then I know she, she, she must really be hurting in that, you know, the steel bar like that. I was even hurt. When I went back to the car, oh, there's going like this. I mean, and that's what I would maybe want to go to the phone. I mean, I really wanted to help her. I, my mind started clearing up. What are you doing? 
you had a chance to make another friend that kept yelling at myself. You, you like to make friends. And then that's when she started telling me where she was from, in, in uh, Wisconsin and all that. And I said, well, say, why don't you, um, I'm not even thinking about her right now. I said, hey, why don't you let me show you around town? I said, yeah, I want to show you something. There's really a nice view over here. I mean, you see the nice river. And I think I met somebody who probably has something to tell your parents about them. Uh, but as I walked out of the car, I carried my knife with me. I had every intention to hurt me. I laid down in the grass, and I remember opening up a bra and uh, bra and everything. I'm just feeling it. So, and they just start stabbing them. Killing them uh, was a, seemed to be the thing you were supposed to do. That was part of life. Driving the car was part of life. Eating food was part of life. To me, it seemed like killing was part of life. Until I did it, and then I drove away, and then I looked like the one on Pierce Better Road. What are you doing? And then I I just couldn't turn myself in. That's why I kept getting on the phone. Will you catch me and stop me, or catch me, or something like that? Or? You say that you both got into the tub? Yes. And you should positive about that. Yes. Because I mean when I, I remember when I pushed her head under water I could see her face. Did you push her in by her push her head down or did you push her in the chest area to, under the water or held her shoulders down. You held her shoulders down? Yeah, that, uh, Both hands then? Yeah. They were surprised to hear that he murdered Kathleen Greening because he was never suspected of it. Paul said that he wanted to confess, to come clean, and offer closure and apologize to the families of his victims. He said that he really did feel guilty and he lost control of his actions. No actual motives were ever given for any of Paul's crimes. It's bizarre that all the women were also wearing red, but he never had an explanation for that. But that has been the disturbing case of Paul Michael Stefani. What a piece of shit. Thank you so much for watching. Watching. I really appreciate it, and especially if you made it this far. This is the first installment of a new series I'm looking to do, and hopefully anyone watching this enjoyed it. If there's any cases that you want me to cover, just let me know. But anyways, I'll see you later.